the Soviet Empire extended across Europe into Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and into East Germany, which called itself the German Democratic Republic. Stalin had chosen Walter Ulbricht as the ruler of East Germany. He headed a regime servile to Moscow. After Stalin's death, Ulbricht pressed on, rebuilding his part of Germany along Stalinist lines. And unsere Straße veränderte ihr Gesicht. Wo vor Monaten noch Ruinen standen, waren Konstrukteure, Maurer und Zimmerleute an der Arbeit. Heavy industry was built up to meet the demands of the Soviet economy. Workers were ordered to increase their output. Everyday needs were neglected. The uh, normal population. The average person lived very badly. If you're talking about the things everybody needs, like heating, coal, electricity, these things were all rationed. Electricity for domestic use was simply not available. The morale of the population dropped to zero. The morale der Bevölkerung war, ich würde sagen, unter Nullpunkt. Like Stalin, Ulbricht tolerated no opposition. The secret police, the Stasi, had its informers everywhere. Many churches were closed. Censorship prevailed. But East Germany was unable to stop people deserting to the West. Travel to the British, American and French sectors of Berlin was open to East Germans. Thousands simply packed their bags and left. The flow of East German refugees to sanctuary in the western sector of Berlin reaches record proportions with news of the death of Stalin. Conditions are none too comfortable for these people, but they are happy to be beyond the reach of the Reds. Undeterred, Ulbricht demanded renewed loyalty from East Germans. Alarmed, the new leaders in the Kremlin ordered Ulbricht to soften his rigid policies. He complied only half-heartedly, the hated production quotas remained in place. If you were timed with a stopwatch to make a screw, and it took you four minutes, you are now expected to do it in two and a half. That was the shocking thing, this raise in work quotas and the pressure to produce. It was all too much for working people. Popular anger exploded. Workers took to the streets of East Berlin. When we passed construction sites, everybody, metal workers, locksmiths, masons, carpenters, all joined us. When we arrived at the city hospital, there were several thousand people with us. Banners appeared at the construction site saying, down with the work quota increases. News of the growing unrest soon spread to West Berlin. I was having lunch in an open-air restaurant in West Berlin on the 16th of June, when a friend of mine who was in military government and probably in intelligence drove past and said to me, Charles, you ought to be in East Berlin. So I got into my car and I went over and ran into the building workers who by that time had left the building sites, were on strike and were marching through East Berlin. And where I caught up with them was near the Friedrichstraße Bahnhof station, the main station right in the middle of East Berlin. And by that time, uh, striking in itself was a, was, a, was, a, was a political act, was an act of rebellion. But marching through the streets was something more, was almost kicking off a revolution. <laughs> Strikes and mass demonstrations erupted in East Berlin and throughout East Germany. Demonstrators tore down the symbol of Soviet domination, 
the hammer and sickle. <laughs> Government authority in East Berlin collapsed. A senior East German communist, Karl Schördewan, was horrified. Ulbricht, Gretewald, Hernstadt and a few others were all inside the Soviet headquarters at Karlshorst. They just sat there and talked among themselves, but nobody made any decisions. Nobody called for a meeting of the Central Committee. I thought the party was leaderless. The demonstrators vented their anger on all visible reminders of communist rule. The Soviet authorities were astonished that Ulbricht had allowed the crisis to get out of control. When Ulbricht arrived at the Soviet headquarters at Karlshorst, he telephoned Karl Scherdewan and asked him what was going on. Scherdewan reported that there were a lot of drunks in the crowd and they were smashing the windows and were about to break in. Ulbricht put the phone down and said, in German, it's all over. He said it in a way which, in Russian, roughly translates as, it's the end. I wondered, what did it all mean? Even if they smash the windows, they have no weapons. It will take us no more than five minutes to sort them out. They were trying to elect a strike committee from the leaders of the workers when four Russian tanks drove into the square, four abreast, and went straight for the crowd. And I remember one man got caught and was run over by a tank. Russische Panzer stoßen vor. Werkzeuge der Gewalt gegen die Freiheit. Mit dem Mut verzweifelter gehen die Arbeiter mit Eisenstangen und Steinen auf die Panzer los. Der Ruf nach Einheit und Freiheit erschallt noch lauter. Da peitschen die ersten Schüsse durch die Straßen. We couldn't do anything against the tanks with our bare hands and stones. As soon as the firing started, people began to drop down, wounded or dead. The shooting broke up the demonstration. For us, the dream of freedom was over. Soviet troops quelled the revolt throughout East Germany. At least 40 people were killed and thousands were arrested. It was the first time that East German and Soviet troops closed off the Soviet sector of Berlin from the rest of the city. The British, the Americans and the French were all for a quiet life. Their concern was to have security of the access routes to West Berlin, that they wouldn't get into difficulties with the Russians. That was all they were interested in. They did not want to get involved. <laughs> With the situation stabilized, East Germany's rulers set off for Moscow. Outside of the Soviet bloc, few countries recognized Ulbricht's German Democratic Republic. In the Kremlin, the ubiquitous Molotov signed another agreement with the Germans. Stalin's old cronies, Malenkov, Voroshilov, Khrushchev, Bulganin, Mikoyan, and Kaganovich decided to stick with Ulbricht. Carefully orchestrated for the cameras, the Politburo bid farewell and good fortune to their East German comrades. One person was missing, Stalin's secret police chief, 
Lavrenti Beria. The Kremlin claimed he spied for the West. Later that year, he was executed. In September 1953, Konrad Adenauer was re-elected as West Germany's Chancellor. Adenauer wanted his half of Germany to become a partner in NATO, the West's military alliance. We wanted a strong NATO as a defensive barrier against the Soviet Union. We also wanted to prevent any expansion of the Soviet Union into Western Europe. We could only achieve these aims if we had a West German army. With American backing, Adenauer persuaded Britain and France to let their former wartime enemy into NATO. In 1955, West Germany was allowed to form an army. The Soviets quickly countered West Germany's admission into NATO by forming their own military alliance, the Warsaw Pact. The pact formally bound the armies of the communist satellites to the Soviet high command. The new treaty legitimized the presence of Soviet troops in Eastern Europe. Both East and West claimed their alliances were defensive. Both prepared for war. But the Soviets wanted to reduce tension in Europe. Molotov, the Kremlin's hardline foreign minister, was ordered to negotiate an Austrian peace treaty and the withdrawal of Soviet troops. Only Molotov spoke against it. The others were more restrained. He said, why should we withdraw? We're very comfortable there. That was his position. But most of the Soviet leaders disagreed with him and thought we had to make a goodwill gesture and start talks in Europe. In Vienna, Molotov joined John Foster Dulles and the British and French foreign ministers in signing a peace treaty. Britain, France, America and the Soviet Union agreed to end their military occupation of Austria. In return, the Austrians promised permanent neutrality. Ten years after the end of the Second World War, the West and the Soviet Union withdrew their troops. Their departure encouraged some people to hope that one day Soviet troops might also pull out of Eastern Europe. 